Hello and welcome to another episode of Throttle Stop Garage. In this episode, we're going to have a look at roll centers and suspension dynamics. Stay tuned. Oh, before we get going, I just want to apologize for uh, being so long between videos. It's really uh, nothing and, and nothing that I could do. Again, if you haven't watched the five mistakes video, I will put it uh, somewhere here. I'll link it and you'll see why it's been such a long time. So I'm, I'm right in the middle of redesigning my entire suspension in essence from scratch. And uh, there's packaging problems and all kinds of other stuff that are rearing their ugly head. And it's just taking epic amounts of time. There's nothing much to film when you're doing this kind of work. It's mostly being done, of course, by me on the computer. And I'm just trying to work it all out. But as part of working it out, uh, I'm going to go through the roll center thing. In the other video, in the in the five mistakes video, I did have a brief rant, which I, I don't normally do on the channel, to be honest. But I was a little bit critical of other videos that go over roll centers in a very sort of vague, two-dimensional way. Uh, so I hope this video will help you get some understanding about what roll centers are going to mean for your car. So I guess first up on the roll center uh, piece is just a quick discussion about what we're actually talking about. So there's lots of different, I mean, and you can find endless debates online and you can see lots of videos on YouTube, but what they don't do is explain the, the pieces that you actually need to know. Now, if you're designing a suspension right from the start, right from zero, you probably don't need this video, okay? You probably know enough about suspension dynamics and what the numbers that are coming out of computer programs and things are telling you that all of this is not going to be particularly relevant. But if you're like me, a guy in a garage just looking to fulfill a dream, then you're going to need a little bit of extra information because it just isn't anything much out there that covers the problems that you're going to find and the what that a roll center actually is. What you need to know is roll centers are an important tuning tool. So I'm going to repeat that. Roll centers are a tuning tool. So most of us are not designing suspensions. Most of us are simply using a suspension that we've purchased or stolen from another car and are putting into our car. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about tuning. So as we begin our discussion on roll centers and tuning, I thought it would be useful to go over the standard roll center height determination using the geometric method that's presented in every single YouTube video. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time here. I'm just gonna quickly whip through it. And then I'm gonna show you a technique that works a lot better for tuning. And then I'll show you how we implemented it in the project. So uh, to start with, we've got the model that we're going to use here. We need a vehicle center line of some sort, a center of gravity in the ground. Then we're going to add to that the wheel and tire combination. Now we're using a short long arm suspension in the car. So that's the system that I'm using to present here. So it's got a shorter upper control arm and a longer lower control arms, really standard stuff. Uh, now, to this, we have pivots that are located on the frame, right? So they're going to be not moving in our fictitious little example here. And then we're gonna add in an upper ball joint and a lower ball joint. Now we're meant to draw some imaginary lines these imaginary lines will connect the upper ball joint and the upper pivot and the lower ball joint and the lower pivot and then they'll meet off in space somewhere. So let's add those lines in. So here's our upper line and here's our lower line and they intersect at a point that we're going to call the instant center. So this instant center thing, if you imagine that you I don't know, have that as a pivot point for your suspension, that's the point that the whole thing will articulate through. Now, once we've got the instant center sorted out, we're going to add in another component. So we need to have the contact patch center. That's a really important point. And then we're going to connect the instant center to the contact patch center point with a line. And that's gonna be a force line, right? So that's the force line that we're gonna draw in in orange. Now, as soon as we've got that done, then we've fully rendered one side of the vehicle. So let's put the other side of the vehicle in, same. And then where those two force lines intersect, at the purple dot, we're going to call that our roll center. And then it has a height above, hopefully above, and sometimes below ground. So if we take a look at this as our method, it involves determining in great detail where the pivot points are located uh, with respect to 
all the other suspension components. So we have to know where the ball joints are, we have to know where the pivots are, we have to know the lengths of the arms, and there is an easier method. So that's the standard presentation of how roll centers work and how we work out the geometries. Uh, it's just, I don't find it particularly useful, okay, so for the following reasons. Uh, first up, let's just think about that suspension just for a minute. So when we plot that roll center, it's based on having some knowledge of where those links are and how they might be moving, uh, but it's all done statically, right? So it's just done from one position. So we know if we put a wheel into bump or if a car is going to roll, then we know that roll center isn't going to be there. So all the videos that say that's the point about which your car rolls, it's not the point about which your car rolls. It's the intersection of two force lines. It's not even conceptually the right thing. Secondarily, uh, we're going to have some extra complications that come in because the model is really simple. This is a simple two-dimensional model and I drive a three-dimensional car. So when we look at things like that center of gravity that's just sitting right there, the center of gravity is sitting uh, probably in by the driver somewhere. It's not sitting right between the links. Uh, so that moment arm that everyone talks about is being able to swing your car over and all, let's just leave it alone for a while. Okay, conceptually again, probably close enough. Uh, and you could probably reduce it down to something that might work. But I think, again, in my own head, it makes it too simple. And then we're going to have a quick look at the links, and then that kind of blows everything apart. So my first problem with the entire setup was if I have to model my links, given that the position of my the front point of my upper control arm uh, and the rear point of my upper control arm, they sit like this to give us a property called anti-dive, which is a side view. So if we looked at the intersections of points in the side view, you'll see that this anti-dive is, and essentially as well as anti-squat in the rear end of my car, is designed to geometrically control the articulation of the suspension under uh, weight transfer. Okay, that's what's going on. So um, it's more complicated is all I'm trying to say. So I'm just gonna zoom in on the suspension and give you a quick look and go, okay, well, where would we plot the two dimensional points in our three dimensional suspension? Or maybe we should just accept that this is a two dimensional doodle that everyone posts on uh, YouTube because it's kind of fun and it might be, they think helpful. But if you were trying to tune this, you gotta go and remeasure all these points and put them somewhere, it'd be a complete nightmare. So the next, so I'm gonna show you the suspension real quick just so you can uh, understand what I'm talking about. And then we're gonna move on to the simpler method. And as we can now clearly see, the front position of my upper control arm and the rear position of my upper control arm are in two completely different locations. They're displaced significantly. And this is not as, as you can tell here, the machining on the top of the upright tells you the angle that uh, GM sort of wanted it sitting in the Corvette, and we've reduced that angle quite a bit, um, but they're not in the same plane. Now, my lower control arm pivot points, metal, a little harder to see. We've got one here, and we've got one here. And they are sitting in a level plane. And again, the last time I checked, if we then tried to do something with this particular suspension, we're not working with two intersecting lines. We'd be working with two intersecting planes. And the intersection of the plane would be formed by these three points, right? The ball joint and these two mount positions that are on a frame. So you've got two planes that intersect, and the intersection of two planes is a line, not a point. And the contact patch down here is where really all the action takes place. So in this instance, again, we're going to resort to having a look at where the contact patch is. So that's that contact patch center point right here. And we're just gonna watch it move because that actually is a true representation of what the suspension is doing, where this other two-dimensional stuff, really not all that great. Okay, so let's have a look at another method. First, let's simplify the drawing just a little bit. So we're going to remove the other half of the car. Now, what we're going to do here is 
we're not going to bother measuring where all the links are located. We're not going to measure the ball joints, the pivots, the anything, the instant center. None of that's really particularly relevant. What we actually need to know is what's happening with the contact patch in relationship to the ground. So we simply articulate the suspension. In this case, we're going to move it up by, say, an inch. Then we're going to move it down by a corresponding amount. Right? And then once we're done with that, if we've measured the translation of the contact patch center point, and that would allow us to compute the slope of that force line. And as long as we have the slope of that line and we know where the center of our track of our vehicle is, we can then compute using a little bit of geometry what the roll center height is. So all we need to do is one simple measurement. We need to measure the contact patch center location as we move the suspension up and down about an inch. And when we do that, I mean, it's not an about inch thing, right? Measure it precisely. Then you can get the slope of that line and that slope of that line tells you everything you need to know. In fact, there's really only three things you need to measure for these suspensions to tell you pretty much everything without ever having to go into measuring where each one of those uh, pivot point locations are located. So if you remember from the five mistakes video, I said that the report I got had indicated my rear suspension roll center height was about six inches. So here we're just watching some of my first attempts at making measurements. I didn't get all of it recorded. Uh, I'm just looking in this case at the translation as we're going up and down, try to get a nice stable reference plane. I didn't get it all recorded because it was so unbelievably hot in the garage. Uh, I just didn't push play on the cameras. Uh, and I wasn't too sure it was gonna be worth watching. A lot of this is pretty boring, but here we go. So this is the rear camber. And that camber curve looks just fine. There's no problem there. What we're after there is a certain rate of camber change per wheel move. And then this is the contact patch lateral move, right? Again, I'm just doing this with calipers. And there, I'm gonna take those two measurements and I calculated a roll center height of 1.7 inches, not six. Okay, so as we continue on the suspension adventure, I'm now gonna check the front suspension. So these are just checks that we're going to run through to make sure everything is okay. Uh, and my long acre uh, caster camber gauge didn't have a hub adapter. So of course I just 3D printed one up really quickly. Uh, don't let these things get in your way. Don't spend a million dollars, folks. Uh, just a bolt in the end and that uh, fits as tight as you'd like onto the, this is again, uh, well at this point it's a stock Corvette C4 front suspension that's in the car. There will be some modifications. Again, it was shortened up several inches in order to fit the track of the car or at least fit the track close enough. Uh, and now what we're going to do is articulate. So we've got a jack over here. All right, so it's clamped down to a, another to the frame that's underneath the car, the reference frame. Uh, and then we're gonna move it up a quarter of an inch at a time. We're gonna record the camber so that we can get a camber curve. We also have a pointer down here, just a piece of welding wire that's attached, it's plumb. And the bend on the welding wire is going inboard to where this is the, the correct uh, uh, radius for the tire uh, from the hub center. And we have the correct uh, reference for the contact patch center. Okay, so this has got a 38 millimeter offset. Okay, so then it's pointing back 38 millimeters. We're then gonna be measuring both the distance uh, translationally that it is off of my reference frame, which is this uh, 12 inch square with a machinist's uh, scale on it. And we'll also be measuring how far it goes in and out because we'd like to measure uh, how that contact patch is moving as we're articulating the suspension up and down. Yeah, so with the rear all measured and it turned out fine, then it was uh, onto the front. And honestly, I thought I was just checking it. Didn't think there was a problem. The previous report had indicated that the roll center was a little high at about three and a bit inches, but nothing excessive. So as I'm going up, the one thing I noticed as I was making the measurements was that 
hey, everything was moving a lot. Like the contact patch lateral was shifting a ton. All right, so the camber curve, first of all, was dead stalled early on in the stroke, and then, then it started to move. And the contact patch lateral, as we get moving along through it, was showing me a massive amount of movement, uh, as you can see right there, right? So I had a roll center computed at about 5.7 inches, which is huge. Okay, so now we got a problem. <laughs> so the suspension's got to all come apart. The whole front of the car has to get cut off. Wow, this isn't going to be any fun for anybody. So let's first, we're going to empirically model this. Again, people have suggested, well, you know, you could just go out and grab some computer software and do it all in there. But the problem is I have no intuition about what any of these things mean. So I can't really look at those numbers. This could just be a me thing, but I'm pretty sure it isn't. I can't just look at the numbers and have them tell me anything. And that was really frustrating. But what I can do is empirically, uh, with my welding table and, and making a few brackets, I can install the suspension in a way that can allow me to move it through all of the various positions that I think it might need. And, uh, and then I can directly measure what the roll center is. Because that roll center, again, is the summation of what's going on with your links and their geometries. All right, that's the real key. That's what that roll center number is all about. So here I am just fitting it up and I've got a system in the, uh, for moving the suspension up and down. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna set this suspension up exactly as I had it sitting in the car. So we're gonna mimic precisely what we've got in terms of our, our, our quote unquote problem. And then once I've got it dialed in, I'll test that number to make sure it's, it's okay. And then I can move the suspension uh, link location, so the pivot points, and uh, try them at a number of different locations and then uh, make all the measurements that I need to make really rather easily once I got it established. So if you're actually going through this process, um, don't skip ahead to the to the end of the video, but you'll see that I, I can now make these measurements in well under an hour uh, and it takes almost no time in order to make an evaluation. So that's really, uh, it's pretty simple actually in the end. All right, this is kind of fun. Just watch what happens here in that lower control arm as I come up near the top of the stroke, All right? So it's something is binding. The suspension is completely bound up at this level. This is, again, this is in that stock position before I start moving stuff. And now I've added in a few extra pieces here. So I've got some machinist uh, blocks. Those are two, four, six blocks. They're really big, uh, super handy and useful for doing this. Uh, and now I'm just still trying to make the measurements with the calipers. I haven't, uh, haven't quite got my technique refined here, but it's working okay. Soon enough, though, I'll get the get this uh, down to a fine science so I can do it even more quickly. But we have to move stuff because we can't be putting the suspension into, into bind conditions. And then that eventually would have broken something on the car if I'd installed it like that. Wow, terrible. With it being really easy to move the suspension into any uh, position that I like, then that's what I did. I sat for days and just changed the suspension, go out, change the suspension, make all the measurements, go back. So I have endless hours of this footage and really no one needs to watch this. It's the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, it's just careful measurement. It almost became relaxing at some point as long as I didn't look at the car and realize what a mess I'd made. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you get used to it. Just replicate measurements, make sure you're doing everything as accurately as you can. And then hopefully we're getting it honed in on 
a position where we're happy. And happy involved talking to my other engineer and getting a really good uh, sense from him about where we should be headed. So uh, emailing back and forth and uh, getting a rough idea and then trying to hit those marks. So we know that we want to hit a, a roll center height that's going to be, you know, two and a half inches would be really nice to reduce jacking forces and to have optimal camber curves of around 0.6. Uh, degree per inch of wheel move would be just perfect. So that's what we're trying to hit here. So I've got a target in mind and boy that makes a big difference when you start knowing what you're doing. You can make the move, check it, measure it and see what the effect of the move was. And with that done, it was time to get the real uh, steering put in place. So I needed to make a new set of brackets because of course the steering ran right into my old bracket. So the real steering rack has to get installed. So I got the bracket uh, built over there. And then I just tacked those brackets into place. And of course, every time you tack anything into place, they're going to pull in the direction of the tack. So it comes a torch again. <laughs> Don't let this stuff defeat you. Just warm it up. Uh, pull it back into square and get on with your day. Anyway, so we pull it back into square, everything's all right, and uh, away we go with the real steering rack. And with the steering in place, it was time to get on with all of the real measurements, just checking the steering height, making sure that it's installed in the correct reference. But uh, more importantly, I think I must have put the suspension into about 12 different uh, positions along the way. And I have graphs for all of it, but of course, most of it's not going to be all that understandable. But here we go. So that was what we had originally for, for the camber curve. And then as we move through to the final, you can see how we've changed that up curve is about the same what we've done is just decrease the angle uh, where it starts so we've changed the rate but again the shape of the curve for your camber curve doesn't really change when you're just moving the links around it's just where it's being positioned uh, and if you can sort of visualize that that's the important part now we're going to go on to that lateral move and you can actually see we're making some significant differences in the change. And the roll center height calculation is a little different here than it was before, only because I've used a much more accurate method with the, uh, with the digital indicator. So it's a nice smooth curve, a uh, lot less error, and you can see what's happened. So we're, we've lowered it. I kind of went too far and then I went back. We're looking for a roll center height of around two and a half inches above ground. It's going to be just fine. And that also allows us to get the correct camber profile of about 0.6 degrees per inch move that we were interested in targeting. All right, so there, now you can see why that roll center height is important. Again, I, I, the shapes of these things don't change. What changes is their relative position, like how they actually sit and move on the graph. It makes a huge difference to how this car is going to behave. So I'm now happy with where things are roughly. I still have some more tuning to do uh, to get the final points. And now that I have it all sitting on the bench, it's actually pretty straightforward to make all of the measurements that I need to take that suspension and then get it into the computer and start the design uh, to get this back into the car. Again, this is going to take a long time, but um, that kind of wraps up the analysis. Well, I ever glad to see you made it this far. Okay, that's a wrap for this video. I'm still not done. I'm still not done. I have a few more things that I'm testing on the bench here. And again, I have a lot of computer work to do. When you're redesigning the suspension in this case, well, this is the second time I've done this. Uh, I'm trying to come up with new ideas. I'm trying to, again, if you've got ideas, that's what the comments are for. Uh, shoot them down below. I mean, other than, again, my rather horrible skills with the camera, I, who cares? We're building a car here, folks. Help me out. Uh, but we're uh, we're moving along. I've made it almost through the depression. I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to stay positive about the entire thing, and that's really tough. I can tell you, coming out to the garage every every day and having a look at the mess is uh, has not been good. But uh, I'm getting there. So a bit, it's been a bit slow. It's going to be a bit slow probably for about the next month or so until parts start showing up. Uh, but I got to design them first. It has to literally fall out of my head because nothing has been done that's like this. I have to really figure out ways of packaging the suspension in as tight as I can. Anyway, so thanks for sticking with me all the way to the end. Um, I do appreciate the support actually. Just, 
you know, it's... Speaking of support, uh, new coffee cups, right? These ones are super nice. With the fancy Made in Canada logo on the side. Uh, and there's new shirts in the Teespring store. <laughs> Every little bit helps <laughs> for the channel. Last but certainly not least, I'm also working on a, a couple of other projects related to the car. So I will be spotting those in. So the next videos will not be on suspension. They're going to be on something else. All right, so stay tuned and uh, please catch those. Don't forget, like, subscribe, ring the bell. Do all those things that make the algorithm happy. So keep your stick on the ice.